Dark are ready to start a presentation, so here you go. What else? Have the lights, uh, especially turned down, and the moonlighting is, is on, so uh, relax, <laughs> and enjoy. I started the last slide, so I'll just go <laughs> As I said, uh, we've uh, dimmed the lights for you this evening, uh, we've got the new lighting on, um, relax, take a drink, enjoy. Um, okay, so tonight we're going to talk about games playing computers. Um, uh, firstly, I'm kind of maybe going to plug ThinkArc for the last four years. This has kind of come out of ThinkArc, which is uh, a group of people that have um, effectively done projects within Cardiff to respond to social issues within Cardiff. Our first project was an empty shop project. Not very techy, not very electrical, but um, it was kind of from here that we developed into um, playing games. This is Team Rage, they're undefeated in every game they've ever played. Um, and this was a zombie game in Bristol. Um, yeah. Yeah, so uh, what uh, kind of happened and what was born from the Think Park was this idea of kind of games and play. And um, we kind of decided to kind of investigate and see what other people were doing kind of in the UK mainly. So yeah, the last picture was kind of us playing this crazy zombie chase game in, in Bristol where you literally got hunted down and feared for your life. I heard that people wept at points. <laughs> I wasn't one of them, um, he was, um, but uh, we kind of uh, yeah, had a little look at what was out there and this is a game called Sonar which was, um, a bloop, sorry, which is um, part of a, uh, a game festival in London called Hide and Seek, some of you kind of may be aware of it, and um, we were kind of interested in how technology and people would come together and create sort of some fun and interactive games. Just as a, a side note, this is a game called Conspiracy for Good, probably the worst game I've ever played, uh, run by Nokia, effectively, um, which was interesting in terms of tech, but the actual game itself was pretty, pretty ropey. Um, and then this is an awesome photo of Laura, <laughs> who's actually in the audience today, which is awesome. Um, I think this is the first time, this is our first game we made, I think. Uh, called Human Bingo, which is <coughs> collecting numbers from people's backs, in this case, their, the back of their heads, with your mobile phone. Uh, you have a bingo card, uh, which the numbers you get, then you run back and shout house, and you win the game. So I think what we learned from quite a lot of these games are tech kind of helps you create the games and play the games, but it kind of comes down to games that exist and kind of twisting them in some ways. Yeah, and kind of what we kind of felt and what we learned was the kind of importance and the enjoyment that comes from the human interaction. Um, so you're not sitting in front of a screen, you're kind of witness to other people playing the games, but then you're also kind of part of it as well. So we kind of wanted to develop this idea further with um, some of the other games that we kind of um, started to design um, over the last three years now. Um, and I'm just going to play some videos to kind of describe some of the games we've been involved in recently. Um, this is Reverie, this is uh, Everwake, sorry, Reverie's coming later. Um, this is Everwake, um, and I think this photo for me is maybe why we do what we do, in the sense of it's quite unusual for people to still be playing at the age of 18, 22, playing skipping in the middle of a... Uh, school playground with uh, a woman who's about 25 acting as if she's 14 as a school girl. So I'm going to play a video and give you an idea of what we do.
would send me the email. They packed up their stuff, put this place on the market, and went. Even when they couldn't see him, they knew he was there. The girl had been sent away from home when her mother got ill. Her curious mind had obviously got her in trouble with Mrs. Blackwell, the headmistress. I'm getting good now. I know where to look. Match the dates, find the right newspapers, the land registry, the births and deaths registry, the police records. It's all there. Save us. Save us. Voice over. Um, <coughs> okay. um, so this was kind of Everwake, and this is basically our first attempt at um, a kind of multi-platform game, um, which was told through um, multiple platforms. As surprise. Um, so we had Twitter feeds, um, an online um, a website, and blogs from the main character, and um, this kind of all came to a head really um, two weeks before the actual physical event. Um, what we were interested in doing was kind of um, almost kind of interrupting people's lives. Um, so once they bought a ticket, you could have access to all this content um, and, and kind of gain more insight into the world that you're actually going to um, be involved with. Um, and that kind of also involved phoning people, um, emailing people, texting them. And what that did was it made the astrophysical event itself just that much more powerful to people who had consumed this content. And just to point out that this isn't kind of role play, we never ask people to play a role. Um, I think it's very important not to ask people to do stuff that they're not comfortable with. I'm from a very much um, performance background and even as an actor if I'm asked to do something and play a role within a situation where I'm not prepared to, I find it most excruciating. So, you know, we kind of felt that we're not going to ask other people to do that. So you come as yourselves and you play the game as yourselves, which is kind of really important. Um, and so kind of moving <coughs> on kind of from that game, then we kind of uh, created another very small game, much smaller scale, um, called I Spy. This is fake tech. But it's quite nice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to, Just don't look at it too closely. Yeah, the, the, the thing, the boxes don't go into boxes, they go into glue. Um, and it has took me about two days to make up. It cost me about 20 quid worth of just random bits of uh, tech. Um, but what, but what, wasted. Yeah, wasted. <laughs> but what these were, these were listening devices that then you then rang a telephone number and then listened to what was on the other side of the window or the, or the wall. Um, and this, the technology that we're using for that is um, just an amazing resource, really, an open platform that allows you to do that. And I guess as our games have developed, our technology has developed, and our desire to use tech. Um, so I'll just give you an idea of um, this was a, a game that we, we created, or more of a narrative that we created using a telephone system, where we basically tried to do Darren Brown, if you like and try to make two people or people choose a particular psychic card by the end of the experience. So one person chose a blue card and one person chose a yellow card. And at the end, they were either meant to choose water symbol or the sun symbol and by listening to this audio and doing a few bits and pieces. When we tested it, there was eight people we tested and eight out of eight did it. We controlled it 100%. And we thought, yeah, I got it. And then when we did it on the day, yeah, it wasn't very good at all. So it's work in progress, but it's kind of a nice I idea. Um, <coughs> This is a project I'm working on at the moment with Pervasive Media Studio, which is called Bike Tag. Um, each bike has a particular colour that they can choose. You can't quite see it here, but the black one's, uh, sorry, the back one is red, the front one's blue, 
and as they pass, they tag each other, it turns green. Um, you, so the idea behind this is it highlights uh, cycling, it safe, makes it safer, but then long term it could aid in urban planning and, and council knowledge of because of the data will be collected. Um, we, today we received uh, confirmation that we'll be getting a bit of funding for this as well, so um, that's good, although deadline's like next month, so that's not so good. Um, but it's kind of led us on to, in terms of game terms, a bit more um, what, we, what will be coined by uh, Mark Sorrell from Hide and Seek as computer uh, mediated or assisted games, which we're very interested in. Um, and should we play Joust? And we'll play Joust as an example, which is uh, by a guy called Johann Sebastian. point of view and the games we play are about spectators and players and people who don't know you're playing the game could be looking in and viewing what you're doing is quite interesting or daft or bizarre and when you then play games on general consoles you're looking at screens whereas this kind of is that in between bit where you're using tech to aid the game but then you're also there's spectators watching and it's just as interesting as for them as well as the players, and there's no real screen, so I think that's interesting for us and something that we want to look at in the future, really. Uh, this is a massive plug. <laughs> <laughs> so, Everwake was part of a three part series. It was six. We then got realistic and realized we had other lives. Um, and Reverie, which is the follow up to Everwake, will be happening at the end of May and it'll be going for six nights. 
which is a ridiculously long time to be doing it for. Um, so if people are interested in playing, being involved, volunteering, acting, um, then please get in touch. And just to say, kind of for rever Reverie, will kind of be our first attempt at some kind of interesting tech with um, some projections, RFID cards, and kind of cool shit like that. Um, so we have a guy that's working with us who's going to be coding some bits and pieces. So this will kind of be the real test is if we can kind of literally not just kind of plaster tech onto a narrative, but make the tech intrinsic to the narrative so it's it, it's meaningful rather than meaningless. And yeah, we're looking for people to come and help create games with us. Um, so yeah, so just later if you're interested um, or just come and play. The end. Generally, we, if if you want people to come and play, they have to perhaps bring a phone. And generally, okay, not everybody necessarily has that technology or that phone that will enable them to do that. You know, so um, to allow the games to be open <coughs> and accessible, because we can't provide it because we don't have obviously the funds to do like like Nokia did do that. They give everybody a game, a, 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 um, a phone to play which was amazing if you could do that and, and have the augmented reality, which is what they sort of did with sort of point seat stuff. That's great, but I think, um, yeah, it still, still kind of takes you back to that screen where you're kind of looking through something else. But, you know, I'm not going to say we'll never do that. Um, I think just at the minute we're kind of a little bit more interested in just some other bits. Yeah, hello. Can you stick your first slide up again with the email addresses on the phone? Yes. And also, um, I, I don't think you can. I don't think you can. You don't have to limit, you, limit yourself to people in their twenties. Like I'm, I'm in my early forties. I even have a problem with doing it, a lot of that sort of stuff. It'd be great fun. I don't. No, I, I think like be, be kidding me, something. So yeah. Just get in there. To, to be honest with you, uh, what we found, what is quite bizarre, is traditionally this kind of stuff is interesting for twenty-five to thirty-five year olds, and yet actually the. The, the gamut of people we've had are literally from 18 to 60. Yeah. Like our games, literally, uh, that's the age range that we're getting. And it's pretty much equal as well. So, I mean, for us, that's quite interesting on the level of some of the other stuff we think ARC we're doing is how we do get people from these various different age groups together at the same time. And in some ways, some of these things are making that happen. So. Yeah, you know, pretty good for us. And it's also getting that language right with kind of when people when you say game or pervasive game or kind of just yeah, just game, people just immediately think of something either sports with with pervasive game and they think it's you know, you're gonna be playing football in the streets or something like that. Um, or um, yeah, there's kind of resistance to it and not maybe necessarily understanding there's a lot more layers and um, immersive experience that, that is, is created around it. Uh, which kind of makes it perhaps a bit more enjoyable to, to some people and a bit more appealing to a wider audience. So I guess particularly here in Wales, with kind of stuff like this, we're still kind of trying to build an audience for it um, and hopefully that will kind of happen in the next few years. Hello. Hi. Uh, there's another question. I, I was, uh, I don't know how to call it in English. Scout? 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 Yeah. yeah. So I was a scout, kind of. I was with the girls, though. Yeah. So it was, <laughs> <laughs> it was funny. This is not a confession. <laughs> 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 My mom was involved in this. She's still involved in it. Was, and the things that we used to do, we're still, still doing, is inventing games and playing outdoor games. So can you consider checking the games that the scouts play because they. Every week they were inventing a new game. They use the kind of 
idea of play and the sense of play and that it's okay to run around and if you're kind of 33 and you know, in fields and that's fine, you know, it's it, you kind of shed all your inhibitions and once people start playing it's great. Amazing. When I'm 65, you can change playing those games. Yeah. Good stuff. Sorry, what was the, um, what's the actual plot of the last game and how was it, did you conceive it or in terms of the story you wanted to tell or just mainly in ways to get people interacting with the story itself? So, Everway? Yeah, yeah. Everway. Uh, Everway was a story about a uh, a guy called Tom who just arrived in Cardiff around about three or four months ago. He had very few friends in Cardiff. So he, was a new, new, he was coming for a new job and he'd always been a bit different. And in Cardiff there were, he had episodes, initially fits, and then he realised they were actually visions of ghosts. And he, he started becoming quite obsessed with this and started collecting experiences of ghosts, mapped those out, and then realised that actually these were these ghosts were in limbo and they were trapped. And he needed people to come and help him uh, save and release these uh, beings from limbo and take them basically to heaven or hell. And you as a player were that conduit really, you were the one playing, in, involving yourselves with those characters, uh, playing a game with them, but then release them from uh, limbo either way, and that's fundamentally where it stopped. Tom by that time was very ill, because he'd been taking various drugs and things like that uh, within the story, and that's where we leave it, and then Reverie picks up from there, uh, which kind of goes a bit more, um, more in, in, internally within his brain rather than ghosts, which is a bit more of a memory-based game. And did you guys did you come up with that story together as a normal story and then think how this could be a game? Or you thinking, For us it's story first, yeah. other people would dispute that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we but it's a story we had then. Various kind of game mechanics then within that, um, you know, you could lose a life to your group was you kind of six lives and if you lost the more you obviously lost. But you could also then regain lives within the game from characters. Um, kind of unbeknowingly, but you know, um, not successful. And then you had kind of other sort of randomizers in between, which were kind of um, <laughs> these characters that we call them shadows that would try and prevent you from achieving your goal basically ultimately at the end. So, yeah, we kind of then tailored that to the narrative. So, what, you, what you've actually presented tonight is this like your full time job, or is it just like something you do on like a part time? Or? This is Everything we do is part time. <laughs> no, it's not a full time job. I'm a brand director at a company called Hoffy. Uh, set that up eight years ago with two other guys. Ali is a bit more full time on some of this. Uh, it uh, looks like something which you could do with actually spending a lifetime on. Yeah. Like, like Probably started ten years ago as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yellow Brick kind of exists now as a marketing company that offers these experiences to companies. Um, but we do our own. It's kind of 50-50 at the moment, 50% commercial work and then 50% our own production just because we want to do it. Um, yeah, and you just kind of find the way and means to do it, you know, and that's it really. Um, about Everwake, is it like an on-site game, i.e. does it take place in certain parts of Cardiff? I don't really understand how it's played or where it's played and... Um... Everwake was played in Canton okay. uh, for one night um, and you can in invest yourself in the game and puzzles beforehand online, which give you clues to then, uh, if you wish, you can get so involved that you then can uh, talk about that information to those characters in location on the evening, and you get a richer experience, or you just you know, rock up on an evening and just play the game as you would, uh, just your normal game. So I guess um, it's kind of a time-specific event, so um, you have the kind of physical event on a particular day, and then the uh, online content then is released pre that. So yeah, um, that's yeah, kind of specific. And how is the game sort of played? Is it like a mystery, like a murder mystery, or like what's the nature of the game? Is it like a role playing game? Or? So, uh, so uh, Tom invites you to come and play the game to save these souls. Yeah. You then get given a map. Five or six of you in teams, and you go to any location you want in any direction. Um, and interact with those people and play games. And that's pretty much it. Come back to the end, um, and then there's a more of a theatrical ending. Yeah. Um, you said that you 
said you didn't have a budget for this. Do you find it quite difficult to find locations? Or, you know, to, I don't know, I suppose if you're doing it in the street, it might be difficult to... So for Everwick, we kind of part funded it ourselves, had a bit loan from other places. Reverie will be funded uh, by the Arts Council, which is fantastic for us. I think uh, fantastic in the sense of gaming being recognised or street pervasive street games being recognised. Um, but in terms of locations, in some ways having money is worse because at least in the foot in with Everwick we just went, we have no money. And they went, okay, that's fine. Come and you'd be quite surprised because our belief is that we kind of pick places of interest, obviously. Um, so they might be off the beaten track. And we did pick quite a few businesses. So with screen printers, for example, there is a, um, a character within there. And the idea is that we bring 100 people to that place. Maybe some of them will then use that business later on. So uh, yes, it is very expensive or hard to get, depending on what they are. Last one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Go on. <laughs> In order to invite all these people, do you need super fancy social... <laughs> super fancy social networking? Yeah. Um, uh, we kind of will use Twitter and Facebook to advertise it. Um, but I guess generally um, a lot of these things are kind of by word of mouth. Um, so we've kind of got Everwick as a kind of case study for people to kind of go, oh yeah, I kind of understand what it was. or. Um, somebody will recommend it, um, and that kind of seems to be the most powerful way to market it. To say this experience was great the last time, so you'd hope that you know this experience, the next experience will be just as good better. Um, but yeah, we, we do kind of will kind of market it in, in that way as well. But yeah, I think we're the probably most powerful with these things. Thank you. Yes. I'm looking enough to play both at the way and uh, my spy. And I think with Everway, what was really interesting is, is that we, I think we broke it a couple of times actually, as players, as a team. And I Spy actually was more difficult because it felt like it was more puzzle based and there was a bit of a <coughs> framework and you couldn't actually break it. So I'm just wondering in terms of your new game, will you take, you allow the players to break the game as such? So it's, um, my learned friend Matt Joyce over here realizing the spy. You can't break my spy. It doesn't. You can't just wait in your in your house for an hour, go, realizing where one of the last clues is, and rock up and go, "Oh, here's the last clue," and then realize he had to go to every location. Um, and I think for us, the I think that's maybe the, the, all the games in between. So we've done about five games in between Everwake and Reverie and all of them have been testing a specific thing. So, um, in a way, I Spy was testing like a branching narrative in some ways, or you go to a hub and then you get another bit of information, or three bits of information, you go to another hub, you get another, another bit of information. But what we found with Everwake, and what we really love about Everwake, and what we'll probably be doing with Reverie, is you make your own narrative up by the, by the way you go. So you can choose your locations, therefore your order will be different to everyone else's. So it's not really the same game. We're also, the only other thing we're doing this time, um, officially, is that we'll have a north and south, uh, which will be slightly different. So you can choose a north or a south passage, and that'll be the only, so you won't be able to do both. So we hope people come back the next night by the ticket. No, but they'll have a totally different experience. And there'll be some characters from Everwake that can return, be, uh, and others that won't. So, you know, it should be quite exciting. And kind of part of the idea of giving people different experiences is that afterwards, the legacy of that is that, oh, God, did you go to that location where, you know, I saw this person and did this, and this get the shit out of me. That person go, no, no, but we went here, and it was amazing, you know. So that kind of narrative storytelling afterwards and that legacy, we kind of want to encourage everyone to share their stories afterwards as well. So that's kind of part of that. Strategy, I guess. Well, the decisions that the players made during the first game, will those decisions have repercussions in the next game, such as like the spirits that are now in head, are they going to you know, turn in this way in that sense, or is it going to place just a new story? Um, 
In terms of, so the question was whether uh, the things that happened in Abbey Wake would influence the second one? As far as the actual players' decisions are concerned, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, we, we judged the uh, Ever Wake. We had pretty much 50 50 in terms of the teams in Ever Wake uh, chose right or got it right or got it wrong. So we chose a, a, a kind of maybe um, belief that that is answered in number three and not number two. It's a nice side step, I feel. Um, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up later. So it's it's, a, it's an ongoing narrative that's still continuing <coughs> and it may be resolved in number three, but at the minute it's not going to influence number two. So that's kind of a political answer, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. MP or something. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Cheers. Thank you.